Hey guys, it's Patrick. What if I told you that Warren Buffett's system isn't complicated? It's simple. In this video, we'll talk about what Warren Buffett's simple system for investing is, how you can do it with a real example, and why anyone can do it but few people actually use it. Have you ever thought about how the smartest people are not always the wealthiest? Or why firms with the most talented people aren't always the best? When I was first learning about high finance, like working in investment banking, private equity, or a hedge fund, I was stunned by how difficult it was to be an analyst there. There are thousands of applications for a single position. They pick the truly best candidates in the entire world. Yet the data shows that firms that invest in the stock market don't reliably pick stocks better than the long-term average. Shouldn't the smartest people in the world be able to figure it out better than the average investor? Warren Buffett is incredibly smart. Is he just smarter than everyone else? Or is there something else going on here? It's important to understand the incentives guiding people. There is a reason why so many economists, YouTubers, and others make bad predictions. It's because in the short term, it's nearly impossible to know what will happen. Investing in the short term is more speculation rather than an investment. As an investor, your goal should be to maximize your long-term investment portfolio. The problem with companies that invest on your behalf is they are only incentivized for short-term gains, typically year over year. But given that this is nearly impossible to do repeatedly, it is highly speculative and highly unreliable. High transaction costs are incurred from constantly buying and selling stocks. You have to pay fees and taxes on those realized gains. Whereas the long-term hold strategy that invests in great businesses can compound annually without much input or action from the investor. Warren Buffett does not invest in the short term. He only invests in companies that have a sustainable long-term business. His preferred holding period is forever. Over actively buying and selling stocks in the short term is a losing proposition. That is why the firms with the smartest analysts in the world can't succeed. They are fighting a losing battle. There is no free lunch in this world. You should be wary of anyone who promises large gains in the short term with little risk. It's probably too good to be true. It's much better to invest with a long-term outlook. So how does Warren Buffett pick his investment? Most of this video is drawn from a book about Warren Buffett by Robert Hagstrom, The Warren Buffett Way. This is a book that was not written by or with the help of Warren Buffett, but it was endorsed by him. And it was done by an author who simply observed Warren's decision-making, which revealed a clear process for rational investing in the long term. When buying a car, you wouldn't pick the first one you see, right? You would do as much research as you can, ask people around and test drive until you find the right one. Why should you treat a purchase of a company using stocks any different? According to Warren Buffett, there are only two questions you need to answer to have success in investing. How to value a company and where the market plays into it. Valuing a company begins with understanding the business. Too many investors simply look at the annual financial statements and price alone to make a decision. This is a reflection of short-term thinking and is speculative in nature. To Warren Buffett, buying a share of a company should be no different than owning one. You should see both the same way. So begin by thinking about what is important when owning a company. It starts with understanding how a business works. It's important to note that not everyone has the same expertise as Warren Buffett. We all have different experiences and a sphere of competency. We should focus only on companies that are the easiest for us to understand. If you have more of an insight for certain types of manufacturing, you could begin there. Or if you work in the insurance business, you could begin there. The key is to begin in areas that you already have some level of base knowledge or can easily understand. By understanding how a business makes money and how it compares to its competitors, you can begin to evaluate its long-term prospects and calculate its intrinsic value. Intrinsic value is not stock price. Rather, it is what the company is worth considering the future cash flow it is reasonably expected to generate. Notice I said reasonably expected. There is still some degree of prediction here. You must be rational in your decision making. Are your projections aggressive or conservative? By estimating a company's future cash flows based on both its management's projections and your evaluation of it as a business, you can use a discounted cash flow analysis to come to a value. 
This is as simple as applying a discount rate to each future cash flow and adding up the sum. I will show a demonstration later in the video. Now that you have calculated the estimated intrinsic value, where does the market come into play? Warren bases much of his philosophy on Ben Graham's teaching, one of the most important of which is the margin of safety. This is the concept that you purchase a stock reasonably below what is expected to be worth. The greater the margin, the higher the probability of the investment having success. It turns from speculation into probability. And with rational thinking, you can use this to your advantage to place bigger bets on the companies that have higher probability of success based on the margin of safety you have calculated. Again, this is really important. You cannot let short-term stock prices affect your decisions. You may purchase a stock and volatility can occur and you can go 10 to 20% up or down the same direction or more. You must be patient in order for this to work. You are making a bet on the long-term outlook of a company. The margin of safety is a calculation on the long-term value. Now, if there's a substantial market dip, it may give you an opportunity to purchase a great company for a good price, but market price should be the last thing you look at. You should focus most of your time finding great businesses. Now that you understand the Warren Buffett way, let's go into a case study. This one is one of Warren Buffett's most successful investments, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola meets so many of the tenants that an investor should look for in a great company. It has a long and successful operating history of selling soda products. It has good margins. It returns equity for its shareholders. The business is simple and easily understood. One thing that's really interesting to note isn't that Warren Buffett bought Coca-Cola, but it's when he did. He purchased it in 1989 at a then premium to the stock market, but something caught his eye. It was the recent management changes at the company. Roberto Goizeta took over in 1980 and was doing all the right thing. He cut costs and divested from non-core segments that did not make Coca-Cola money. So many businesses buy other segments not related to them just to grow, even if they don't get adequate return. Goizeta focused on what Coca-Cola did best, make soda. By 1989, Coca-Cola was running a very efficient and effective business on an already irreplaceable brand. Okay, so I have Coca-Cola's annual report here. This is kind of what we're gonna be using today to calculate the value. It's gonna be all based off this, found this online. So first we'll start with calculating owner's earnings. Owner's earnings is a metric that Warren Buffett uses because he considers it more accurate than just using the income. So took some financial data directly from the report. So net income, we have 1,045,000. So we have that 1,045,000,000 and then depreciation, we have 167,000,000 and then capital expenditures, we have 387,000,000. So you take your net income, you add depreciation, you subtract capital expenditures and you get to owner's earnings. Now we're going to go over a couple different scenarios. It's important to note that in this annual report and also the others that Warren Buffett would have been looking at, he saw a growth in owner's earnings from 1981 to 1988 of 17.7%, which obviously is very strong. There was a compelling uh, growth story. There was a compelling uh, future outlook for Coca-Cola. And at the time, the 30-year treasury, which is going to be used as our discount rate here, was at 9%. This would be considered the risk-free rate. So we're going to go over a couple different scenarios and see what the value would be in each one. So Warren thought there was a very good chance that the successful management would continue into the future and that this high growth in owner's earning year over year would continue. So if we have a base case of you know 15% growth in owner's earnings every year from year one through 10 and then stabilizing after year 11 to 5%, we can see that year one to year two to year three, it's growing every year substantially. Again, it's growing by 15%. And then starting year 11, it's going to grow a little bit less, only by 5%. But at year 15, what we do is we take this projected owner's earnings at year 15, and we divide that number by our discount rate, which is the 30-year treasury, which is this number here. So we divide that by 9%, and this gives us our valuation, right? 
or valuation after 15 years of $47 billion. So that's for this best case valuation of $47 billion. Now we do a base case. So 12% growth through years one through 10 and then stabilizing at 5% gives us a value of $36 billion. Okay, so substantially less, but still quite a bit of growth. 10%, which is more conservative case, 30 billion. And let's go to the absolute worst case. You know, they only grow 5% all the way throughout which again, given what Coca-Cola's management was doing and its long-term growth outlook, this would have been you know, very much the worst case scenario. So we have a, a just under 20 billion for year 15 value. So now let's go to the margin of safety calculation. So we have first, let's start with our market valuation of $15 billion. So in 1989, Coca-Cola was worth $15 billion according to the market. It's important to note that this valuation of $15 billion was 15 times earnings, 12 times cash flow, five times book value, a 30 to 50% premium to the market average compared to other stocks with a 6.6% earnings yield, which remember is less than the discount rate. So this purchase was considered a premium at the time. So Warren Buffett making a billion dollar investment in Cola when it was seen as having a premium, right? It's already trading at a high value, made a lot of people scratch their heads. They were kind of, didn't really understand why he was doing it. But then if we compare what Warren valued the company versus what the current market value is, remember that market value is apparently really high, right? So let's look at the different scenarios. So what we do, we have our different cases. We have the valuations for the different cases. We can calculate our margin of safety, which is simply dividing the market valuation by our value. And we see there's a nearly 70% difference in the best case right, of a $47 billion the company's gonna be worth versus what it's worth today, $15 billion, right? In the absolute worst case, like absolute worst case, everything is wrong. There's still a 20% difference, right? This is why the margin of safety is so important and, and calculating intrinsic value is so important. And it's not just great businesses, but it's great businesses at fair prices. No matter pretty much the situation here, Warren Buffett would have made money in the long term because Coca-Cola is such a great business. The long term growth outlooks are so good and the price was at a fair offer. He was in a position where all of the signs were in his favor and he was at the worst case going to make money and at the best case going to make a lot of money. So let's see what the actual performance of Coca-Cola was over the next decade or so. So Buffett bought a billion dollars, give or take, of Coca-Cola in 1989. By 1999, that was worth $11.6 billion. Had he invested $1 billion in just the S&P 500, it would have grown to $3 billion. So comparing those growth rates, the S&P 500 would have grown at 11.6% annualized growth rate, but Warren's investment outbeat it by 16% year over year at 27.77%, right? So this is, this is again, this is what, what shows how great of a bet this is. Warren picked a great business and again at a fair price and he was, all the cards were in his favor. He made a great bet and it paid off handsomely for him and for Berkshire Hathaway shareholders. So I hope this goes to explain, you know, how important it is to look at the long-term value of a company Pick a great companies that pretty much no matter what will be worth more than they're worth today. And Coca-Cola is a great example of that. So now that we know how Warren Buffett analyzes stocks and how he went about it with Coca-Cola, why don't more people do this? Everything in this video is understandable. It's not that complicated. It really comes down to thinking rationally and picking great businesses at fair prices. So how come more people don't do this? The marshmallow test was a famous psychological experiment in the 1960s by psychologist Walter Mischel. In this study, children were given a choice between one marshmallow they could eat immediately and two marshmallows if they could wait for 15 minutes. Not surprisingly, the experiment found that many children opted for the immediate reward over the greater delayed reward. This simple experiment sheds light on a fundamental aspect of human behavior, the challenge of delayed gratification. In the world of investing, there is a huge temptation of securing quick profits today rather than waiting for potentially greater returns in the future. The stock market amplifies this natural inclination by providing constant updates on stock prices. 
which can lead to reactionary decisions based on short-term fluctuations rather than long-term growth potential. The gamification of investing and the popularity of investing apps have made this even more difficult. Average turnovers for portfolios have gone up substantially since Warren Buffett began his career. I've spoke at length about the 2008 financial crisis as a modern parallel. In the lead up to the crash, many investors were captivated by the immediate returns from real estate and mortgage-backed securities, ignoring the unsustainable nature of those investments. The promise of quick gains blinded them to long-term risk. There are also much more financial incentives for short-term success over long-term success. Investors demand yearly profits and growth, and companies set up their structures to reward behavior that benefits short-term performance. When millions of dollars in fees and incentives are on the line, you go with a strategy that gets you the most money, not necessarily what's best for the long-term health of the company. The good news is that anyone is capable of following these steps to think rationally and critically about the stock market and have a long-term strategy, value the fundamentals of the business and purchase ownership of great companies at a fair price. However, you can't truly understand or value any business like Warren Buffett without understanding the ramifications of debt. If you want to gain more knowledge on how leverage affects businesses, then watch my video on Lehman Brothers' use of leverage preceding their bankruptcy in 2008. A quick note, I didn't get to cover the full 12 tenets of the book in this video, but I did cover the most important aspects of it when thinking about investing. If you want more information, I suggest reading The Warren Buffett Way. I got it on Kindle and it is well worth the read. It goes into more depth than I can in a short video and offers a ton of more case studies. Thanks for watching. See you next time.